good afternoon and welcome to Spirit of New Ministries. I'm Pastor Charles Young. Thank you for joining me this afternoon as we break open the Word of God. We are so glad to have the opportunity to study God's Word and to do it together. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, a day that you've made and a day in which we rejoice. We thank you for the opportunity of studying your word. And we pray now that as we do so, you would enhance our understanding, bring to our remembrance the truth that comes directly from your word and help us to apply that truth to our living. So for that, Lord, we give you our thanks, we give you our praise, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you for joining me this afternoon. We are continuing our study in the topic, Victory Over Despair, Discouragement, and Disappointment. And we've been talking about this for several weeks, and we will uh, be coming to the close of this uh, study probably within the next week or two. And just as a brief recap, we talked on lesson one, we talked about trusting God's plan for your life. And then lesson two, we discussed engaging in good grief, knowing that at times in life, all of us are going to experience grief, but there is good grief that we can experience that helps us to find closure during those difficult times of loss in each of our lives. Our third lesson, I talked about praying fervently. The scriptures tell us that we ought to pray without ceasing and in praying that God honors the prayers of the righteous. And so in order for us to get to where we need to get to and to be about the business of kingdom, we need to be praying fervently. We need to be praying consistently. And God honors the prayers of the righteous. Lesson number four, we talked about listening and waiting patiently for God. And that's a result of our prayers as we continue to read the Word of God, study the Word of God, and to pray to God, we also need to engage in the second stage of that prayer process. We pray, we seek God, and we petition Him with our prayers and our supplications. Now the next step is to listen patiently and wait for God to answer. And so as we pray, as we seek God, now we need to take time to wait patiently and to listen for what God is going to say regarding those matters that we prayed for. So we last week looked at the topic of seeking and celebrating God. That was lesson number 5A. Now tonight we're going to look at lesson 5B, which is a continuation of our study last week of seeking and celebrating God. Last week we talked from the Old Testament primarily and we looked at different passages and we looked at different examples. Uh, we looked at the personality of Abram. We looked at Ezra, the scribe and the priest. And then we looked at David as we considered quite a few Psalms on last week. Now tonight we're going to start in the, New T in the Old Testament. We will matriculate into the New Testament. And so we're going to complete our study on this particular topic of seeking and celebrating God. Tonight, I'll ask you to join me in going to the book of Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, we're going to go to the 29th chapter. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, as we look in verse 13, verse 13 really helps us to see how Jeremiah really was encouraging the people to seek after God and in doing so, they would be able to find God. And this was a very difficult time for the Israelites during this time. And actually, I'm going to ask, once you've turned to that Jeremiah 29, 13, um, now I don't have the graphic for these other passages, but if you'll look just a few verses prior to the 13th verse, to verse 10, there it reads, just to kind of give you a little background, it says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then, 
And this is our 13th verse. Going into verse 13 after verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Now, the reason why I wanted to read that passage, even though you don't have the graphic for it, I wanted to read that passage because this was the time when the Israelites were in bondage to the Babylonians because of their sin. They had been in Babylon, and God was telling them, after 70 years of your captivity, you're going to be able to come to me, you're going to be able to pray to me, and I will hear you, and I will bring you back into the land of Canaan. I will give you back into the land of promise. And so as they're praying and as Jeremiah is explaining to them that this is what's going to happen, uh, Jeremiah goes on and he tells them, you might as well make yourself comfortable here because you're going to be here for a while. Uh, you need to plant, you need to pray for the welfare of the city. Uh, and he goes on to, in, into all of that, explaining to the Israelites, because of your sin, you're going to be here for a while, but there will come deliverance. And that deliverance is what he's talking about now when you look at these verses 10 through 12. Uh, and then now our verse for the night, which is verse 13, he says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And again, Jeremiah is really encouraging the saints. And every now and again, we need to be encouraged. We need to have our hearts and our spirits uplifted in the midst of difficult circumstances or trying times and seasons that we all experience. Jeremiah is doing just that, and he's helping the children of Israel to realize that your, your difficult season will come to an end. God has not left you. God has not forsaken you. He has not forgotten you. But the time will come when you will be able to seek him. You will be able to find him, what he says in verse 13. And he says, this will happen when you seek me with all your heart, meaning that you put your sins away. You now seek him with sincerity with earnest, and when you do so, God can be found, and God will bring them out of their situation, and he goes on to say that in that 13th verse. When you look at another prophet uh, of the Old Testament, you go to the book of Amos, and Amos, if you remember, uh, was that prophet who was able to have his own uh, he had the book named after him. He was actually the first prophet who had the book named after himself. And Amos was a very unique personality. He was considered one of the minor prophets. Uh, he was a contemporary uh, with Jonah and uh, with Nahum and some of the other minor prophets. And so when you look at Amos, Amos was as a, uh, his occupation was that of a shepherd and he was a fig tree farmer. But Amos was very unique in the fact that he actually resided in the southern kingdom of Judah. But even though he resided in the southern kingdom of Judah, God had prompted him to prophesy against the northern kingdom of Israel. And he did so because the children of Israel in the northern kingdom were following in like manner after the practices of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles... At that time, they were mistreating people. They were being very mean, and they were being very insensitive to the people that were around them, and the Jews were starting to do the same thing. They were likening themselves after the practices of the Gentiles, and God was sorely displeased with that. And so God called Amos to make declarations of destruction against the northern kingdom of Israel. And so that's what was going on at that particular time in biblical history. And so now, as Amos is making his declaration out of the fifth chapter, we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. And there in verse 4, it reads, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, do not enter into Gilgal, or cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel, uh, or Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it with none to quench it for Bethel. And here, Amos is making this declaration. He is prophesying to Bethel 
the house of Israel to the northern kingdom, and he's saying that you need to seek God and live. And what we're finding in these passages is that there is a direct correlation between seeking God and life, seeking God and having longevity. And we see that all throughout the scriptures. The scriptures are replete with examples and with principles of seeking God and how it's directly related or directly correlated to uh, living long life, having longevity. When we seek God and the things of God and we seek kingdom, uh, and we're going to see that a little later in our lesson tonight, uh, that when we seek God and seek the things of God, life is the result. So he says there in verse 6, seek the Lord and live. And even though, as I said last week, even though these are Old Testament principles, they have New Testament and current day relativity and reality. These are principles that are relevant today. They have current time relevancy. And so when you look at how the Bible tells us to seek God, and these are Old Testament principles, and God is talking to the Israelites, those are same principles that are relevant and practical and real for today in 2021. It's profitable. It's beneficial. It's absolutely necessary for us to seek the things of God even today. We need to seek God. We need to seek his face. We need to seek his purpose in our lives. We need to seek his presence. And in doing so, the word of God tells us that what comes attached to our seeking God is life. And so as we see uh, this passage, seeking God, seeking him on a continuous basis, seeking him with our whole heart is what's pleasing before God and beneficial for the seeker. We move to the New Testament now, and now we're going to spend the rest of our time tonight in the book of Matthew. And in Matthew, there is a lot of information that's there that teach us and confirm that we ought to seek and celebrate God. As we seek God, and it doesn't matter what season of life we find ourselves in, but we need to seek God on an ongoing basis. We need to seek him during the good times. We need to seek him when times may not be so good or may not feel so good. We need to always seek God no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with, and no matter what's going on around us. Our circumstances should not dictate whether or not we seek God. Our situation should not determine whether or not we seek God. We seek God 24-7, 365, and that's even on leap year. We need to seek God every single day of the year, every single hour of the day. We need to seek God. And so here, we see in this passage, we're going to go to Matthew and go to the sixth chapter of Matthew. We're going to start at verse 9 in Matthew chapter 6. And as we go to that sixth chapter, we're going to begin with verse 9 and we're going to read through verse 13. Now, we're going to go through that sixth chapter of Matthew and we're going to consider quite a few different groupings of verses. But we're going to start with verse 9 through verse 13. And here, our Lord Jesus is actually speaking and he's telling the disciples, he's explaining to them kingdom principle. He's explaining to them with respect to how they ought to pray. In like manner, this is an excellent example of how we ought to pray. The way we ought to look at prayer and how we need to approach prayer. And here Jesus says in verse 9, he says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And here Jesus, talking to the disciples, explains very succinctly that when they pray, they need to have these objectives in mind. 
In like manner, we ought to have these same objectives in mind when we pray. Here Jesus says, pray our Father in heaven. And all that is is an acknowledgement of who we're praying to. That we are praying to the head of the Godhead, God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're praying to God the Father, acknowledging his place of dominion in heaven. And so here he says, hallowed, respected, revered, feared, honored, reverenced is the name of the Lord God who resides in heaven. He says, your kingdom come, and this is a seeking and celebrating God. We're asking God, allow these things to come to pass. We, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're seeking after. And he says, your kingdom come and your will be done. Now, I need to kind of pause here for just a moment because so many times we get into the misunderstanding or the misimpression that when we pray, we pray for our will to be done. God, I want this. God, I want this to happen. I have this objective or I have this agenda that I want to see come to pass. And oftentimes our objective or our agenda is in direct conflict with what God's purpose, plan, agenda, and objective is for our lives. So now we're praying in discord. But here Jesus said, this is the way we ought to pray. We ought to acknowledge God, acknowledge his kingdom in heaven. We ought to ask for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done. And that's how we're able to seek and celebrate God in order to overcome despair, discouragement, and disappointment. That there is a methodology behind how we approach prayer and how we seek God in the midst of our prayers. And I mentioned a few moments ago that when we pray, we ought to take time and then listen and be patient to await God's answer and his response to our prayers. And in doing so, that helps to encourage our heart. That helps to gird up our loins and to get our spirit in the right place to be receptive of what God is trying to say to us. It helps us to be able to hear God more clearly and to follow him more dearly. Here Jesus says... Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to recognize that God has an agenda. God has a purpose. He has a plan and God operates and he allows that plan to come to pass in heaven. God reigns, he rules, he has authority, he is diminutive. Uh, or he is dominant in heaven, and so as God operates in heaven with full authority, he operates on earth in the same way. He operates with dominion. He operates with authority. He operates with power. And so the same way that God operates in heaven, he operates on earth. Let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth the same way that your will is accomplished, purposed, and achieved in heaven. And beloved, we need to understand that God is the God of order. He has order in heaven and he has order on earth. And our prayers ought to be linked in similarity. We need to be praying, God, whatever your will is in heaven, however you're running it in heaven, Lord, let it be done here on earth. Let it be so here on earth. Let it be done in my life. Lord, whatever you are doing in terms of how you rule and reign and have majesty in heaven, Lord, let your purpose as you rule, reign, and have majesty on earth in my life. When we pray like that, then we can overcome any kind of despair because God is operating in full authority in heaven as well as in our lives, and our will now matches God's will. I'm not going to be in despair. I won't have disappointing times. I won't be uh, at a place of discouragement to the point where I'm just so wiped out. I can't deal with my circumstances. Even though things may not be working out the way I want them to, as long as I understand, God, this is your will. God, your will is operating in heaven and it's operating on earth. It's operating in a way that's, that's affecting my life. Then, God, I'm all right with that. How can I be in despair? How can I have a spirit of disappointment when I know God's will in heaven is operating in like manner on earth and it's affecting my life according to God's purpose and his plan? Now, continue on in this passage. He says in verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. 
In other words, God is going to take care of us each and every day. It's just like in the Old Testament when the children of Israel, when God was giving them manna, God would give them manna every single day and they weren't to try to hold on to the manna to the next day because each day God provided it. And if they tried to hoard it for the next day, it would become stale. It would become uh, putrid at that point where they couldn't eat it. And that was to teach them that God is the God of our daily supply. He continues to provide for us each and every day. And that's why Jesus, in this prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. And I'm going to talk about how in the, in, in, later on in this passage or later on in this chapter, how we ought to not be concerned about tomorrow because tomorrow has concerns of its own. He goes on in verse 12 and he says, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need to have the spirit of forgiveness. God forgives us of our sins, of our shortcomings, of the things that we do that do not please him. By the same token, what this passage teaches us is that we ought to be ready and willing to forgive others. Just as God forgives us, we need to be open-hearted and open-spirited to forgive others. He goes on in that 13th verse, as we're seeking God, as we're celebrating God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We need to always be mindful that it's never God's purpose, nor his intent, design, nor desire for us to enter into sin. But God has the ability to keep us at a place in our spirits where if we seek him with our whole heart, he delivers us from temptation. Now, understand this. We are going to be tempted. That is an absolute certainty. As long as you're living and breathing on this plane and in this realm of reality, we are going to face temptation. It's going to come. We cannot opt out of it. We can't be exempt from it. But we can overcome temptation. We can resist temptation, and the Bible tells us that if we resist temptation, then the devil's response is that he flees. Here, lead us not into temptation. Allow us to not have the mindset of pursuing temptation. Deliver us from evil. It is a direct response to us not going into temptation that God then delivers us from the evils of this world. And so as you continue in this ninth chapter, I'm sorry, in the sixth chapter of Matthew, we're now going to drop down to verse 19. Verse 19, once again, as we are seeking and celebrating God, this is the perspective that we have in terms of how we live every day. Verse 19 of the sixth chapter shows us how we are to approach our daily living circumstances. There in verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. We ought to have a mindset, a heart set, a spirit set of what's important, of what should take priority in our lives. And here, Jesus once again is saying to the disciples, here needs to be your priority set. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. In other words, don't get so head over heels. Don't get so locked in and pursue treasures on earth. Don't make the things down here, whether they're material things, cars, uh, money, homes, uh, whatever. Don't make these the priority. Now, that does not say that it's, not, uh, that it's bad to have nice things. That's not what this passage is saying. It's talking about where we lay our priorities and what we fix our attention on and focus our attention on, uh, what we give as the priority to our lives, whether it's going to be things of the material or things of the spirit nature. And here Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth because moth and rust will destroy Thieves are going to break in and steal. In other words, you can lose these things in a heartbeat. So don't get so attached to them. Don't get so attached uh, to the things of earth because they can dissipate. They can disappear within a heartbeat. And Jesus is laying that out. Then he goes down to verses 
24 and 26, once again, we're still in the sixth chapter. We're talking about how to seek God, how to celebrate him in light of our current day living circumstances. Here, Jesus says in verse 24 of the sixth chapter, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And I'm going to come back and deal with that in just a moment. He goes on to say, you cannot serve God and money. And that's really where this thing comes to. Once again, Jesus is really reiterating what he just said in verse 19. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. In other words, he's saying you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God over here and then serve the things of the material realm here. You cannot worship money. You can't serve money. Do we need money in order to uh, conduct our daily transactions and to, to meet the needs that we have on a daily basis? Absolutely. But we ought not raise money up to that level of worship. We ought not seek it with everything we have. We ought not just pursue it with every ounce of energy that we have. We recognize that money has its place. And all money is, is a form or a means of us being able to transact and to barter for the things that we need in life. It should not have that worship status. It should not have that God little g status. But money are the, it, it are the, the, the things that we need. Uh, it's the vehicle and the means by which we're able to accomplish the things that we need to do and acquire the things that we need. He says there, you can't serve them both. You can't serve God and you can't serve money. You can only serve God and acquire money so that we can do the things with it that we need to do. He goes on in verse 25 and he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will uh, put on your body. He says, don't worry about these things. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Verse 26, he says, look at the birds of the air. They neither, uh, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Jesus, once again, lays out very, very clearly our perspective with regards to money and how we approach life and how we look at our life and the things that we need in life. He says, do not be anxious. In other words, don't worry. Don't get so overly concerned. Don't become consumed about what's going to happen for tomorrow. What, what, what's going to happen? How am I going to make ends meet? How am I going to do what I need to do? How am I going to provide this? What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? How, how are things going to work out? He said, don't worry about that. Because if we really trust God, God is going to see that those things get met. God is going to provide. He is the God of our abundant supply according to his riches and glory does God provide for us and so Jesus lays out a very clear a very succinct and deliberate case for us not worrying because in order to meet our needs God already knows what we're in need of God is not surprised by changing circumstances God knows long before anything occurs exactly what we're going to be in need of and he gives the example he said look at the birds they don't sow they don't reap they, they don't go about and collecting in the barns and storing things they don't have to do that why because each and every day God provides for them and Jesus says well look at yourself aren't you more important than the birds are and of course we are in God's economy, yes, we are more important than the birds. So if God's going to provide for the birds, he's going to provide for us. In our seeking and celebrating God, we need to acknowledge our station with God and that God is going to provide for us. He goes on, as we drop down to the next grouping of verses, we're going to go to verses 27 through verse 34. And again, this thing about worry, uh, 
It really interferes and it obstructs us being able to have a faithful and wholesome relationship with our God. When we talk about worship and we talk about our relationship with God, when we allow worry to be interjected into our scenario, our relationship and our walk with God, what we're doing is we are allowing a blockade between us and God and it causes us to not walk worthy of what we've been called to. And we've been called to have a trusting relationship with our God. When you look at the 27th verse of Matthew chapter 6, it says, And which of you, by being anxious, or in other words, by worrying, can add a single hour to his span of life? In other words, worrying is not going to make you live any longer. Worrying is not going to change your circumstances. It's not going to cause you to add another moment to life. In reality, what worrying does, it can actually take moments away from our lives. Well, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, you know that worry can have a very adverse effect on our living. Worry can cause so many things in the natural. It can cause heart issues. It can cause strokes, heart attacks. Uh, aneurysm, nervous conditions, you name it. Our body responds negatively to worry. And in doing so, it can trigger some conditions in our body and in our minds and in different organs of our body that are negative and can take life away as opposed to adding life. So many times people leave this life early or suffer adverse health, and medical conditions because of worry. Worry causes people to stress out. Worry causes people to be anxious, to be nervous, to make poor decisions. It affects our body negatively. It can cause heart conditions. It can cause strokes and heart attacks, uh, aneurysms, and all kinds of negative things that happen to the body. So in reality, worry ends up taking life as opposed to adding life. And I believe that that's what Jesus was talking about here. He goes on to say in verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? Once again, Jesus is making this comparison. He says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Now, just a few verses before this, Jesus was talking about the birds of the air. They don't gather. They don't toil. They don't put into barns anything. And now he's talking about the lilies. And what Jesus is doing is he is making the contrast and comparison about nature and humanity. God takes care of the natural things. He will also, therefore, take care of humanity. He says there in verse 28, he says, Why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. In other words, you've never seen a lily, a flower, out there working, carrying a lunch bucket, or going to the job site, or punching in a clock. No, the lilies just do what lilies do, they just grow. God takes care of them. And if God can take care of the lilies of the field because they don't work, they don't sweat, they don't try to figure out what's going to happen, in verse 29 he says, Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon, the son of David, who was king after David, in all of his royal regalia, in all of his garments, was not clothed the same way that these lily of the fields were clothed. He says, but God, if he clothes the, the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, look at what he says, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? We ought to trust God. We ought to trust him day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. We need to trust God each and every single day of our lives because he is the God of our supply. He keeps us. He provides for us. And what Jesus is saying here, if God can keep the birds, if he can keep the lilies, who were not arrayed as well as Solomon was, can he not keep us, O oh, 
you of little faith. When we are anxious and worried about what's going to happen and worried about what God's going to do in light of our circumstances, it is a demonstration of our lack of faith. And we can't seek God and we can't celebrate him if we're operating out of a lack of faith. When you drop down to the 31st verse, there it says, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Once again, all of this is just confirmation that if we're anxious and we're worried about things, these are the things that Jesus was saying the Gentiles worry about those things. And here Jesus was talking to the Jews and he said, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about the things that the Gentiles are worrying about because your God, our God, will take care of us. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, because these things are insignificant. God knows you have need of these things, and because he not only knows that you have need of them, he is also the one who will supply them. The same thing that Jesus was saying to them then, through his word, by way of the Holy Spirit, he is saying the same thing to us now. Don't worry about your circumstances. God's got it under control. We're now going to go to the 33rd verse. And again, we're closing out this sixth chapter of Matthew. And in verse 33 here, Jesus, as he's bringing all of this to a close, he's now saying, now here's what your response ought to be. He says in verse 33, but seek the kingdom of God first. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And again, this really is confirmation of our uh, part B of lesson five of seeking and celebrating God. We need to seek God. In essence, we need to pursue him. We need to go after God. We need to make a solemn and concerted effort to go after, to pursue, to seek God and his kingdom and his righteousness. Well, pastor, how do I do that? We do that by seeking the things of God by his word. What is God's will for our lives? Well, how do I find out what God's will is? I find that out through his word. I find that out through prayer. We talked about earlier about listening and waiting patiently for God. And in doing so, this is how I'm able to overcome the despair, the disappointment, and the discouragement that all of us will face in life. There is a very precise, a very specific methodology as to how we're able to overcome and to walk as Christians in our current day circumstances. And so Jesus says the way to do that is to first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I need to be living holy. I need to be seeking the righteousness of God. I need to be seeing what the word of God says as to how I'm to conduct myself, how I'm to behave in every life circumstance. What should be my uh, modus operandi, so to speak? How do I operate? How do I plan? How do I attempt to do things according to God's will and not according to the ways of this world. And there is a very distinctive difference between the ways of this world and the ways of God. Scripture tells us that wide is the path to destruction, but narrow is the path unto salvation. And so I need to understand that I'm not, even though I have liberty, and Paul talks about this, I may have liberty to do a lot of things, but a lot of things are not beneficial for me. And so I need to understand that there is a prescribed way of how we ought to live, how we ought to think, and how we ought to conduct ourselves. And that's what's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in doing so, we do that so that all of the things that we were stressing over, all the things that we were anxious about, all the things that Jesus says that the Gentiles were anxious about and worrying about what to eat, what to wear, what to drink, and all of that, those things that we tend to do the same thing, he says, don't worry about that because if you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
all of these things will be added unto you. In other words, God's going to supply those things. If we seek God in his righteousness, if we pursue the word of God, if we seek the will of God and govern ourselves accordingly, this is a divine promise that says God will supply the things you need if we pursue God and his righteousness. He goes on to say, therefore, in verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, don't worry about tomorrow. Get through today. Just be concerned about, don't worry about today, because God has today covered. He provides the needs of his people. But we also need to recognize that it is not God's will, it's not his purpose for us, it's not his plan for us to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or next week or next month. Don't worry about that. Trust God for today. And in doing so, God will provide all of those things that we need. I hope you're getting this, saints. I hope you're really allowing this to sink in. Uh, we have a couple more passages, and we're going to go ahead and close for tonight. We're now going to move out of the book of Matthew, and we're going to go into Luke's record of the book of Acts. And in Acts, we know that Luke is the author of this, uh, of this book, and in the 17th chapter, we're going to go to verse 27. Acts chapter 17, verse 27 there it reads that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet, he is actually not far from each one of us. And all that that boils down to is that we ought to seek God. Again, confirmation of what we've been talking about all night that we need to be pursuing God, we need to seek after God, we need to, in essence, what Luke is saying here, that in doing so, they can feel their way toward him. And if we seek God, God will and can be found. He says that we realize that God really isn't far. If we seek him, we can find him. If we make the effort, we can accomplish the goal of connecting with God and having fellowship with him and therefore not having to worry or be anxious about any of our life circumstances. Here, this is a New Testament passage. It has New Testament relevancy for us that in seeking God, he can and will be found. Our last passage for the evening finds its home in the book of Ephesians, that New Testament letter that Paul writes to the saints at Ephesus. And in Ephesians, we're going to look at chapter 5. We're going to start with the B portion of the 19th verse and verse 20 as our last passage for the night. Ephesians, here in the B portion of the 19th verse, Paul says, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here Paul, recognizing that here these New Testament saints, these Ephesians, have tendency to be concerned, but to realize that in the midst of their concern, because you have to realize these were saints who were experiencing persecution for their faith, but here Paul says to them, Sing and make music from your hearts to the Lord. And there is a wonderful example as to how we ought to approach our living. We ought to sing and make melody to the Lord in our hearts as well. We need to celebrate God. In our seeking of God, we need to celebrate him for who he is and for all that he does. He says, in doing so in verse 20, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we ought to always give thanks. In all things, give thanks. In doing so, we celebrate God and we acknowledge God's majesty, his authority, and his provisionary care for each and every one of us. 
In doing so, we demonstrate our faith. And in doing so, we acknowledge that we know that God is the only somebody who is able to take care of all of our needs. Beloved, I pray that this was an encouragement for your hearts tonight as we talked about seeking and celebrating God. We're going to come back next week as we continue our study, Victory Over Despair, Discouragement, and Disappointment. Remember to join us on Sunday mornings at 1015 right here at Spirit of New Ministries. Look forward to seeing you or actually seeing you not only online, having you worship with us, but our church has now reopened and so we're looking forward to people being in the house as we can celebrate in person as well as online. Once again, thank you for joining me. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for teaching us through your word how to seek you and to celebrate you as we study how to get victory over despair, discouragement, and disappointment. Lord, we thank you for your word, for your word is life-giving. It helps us to have encouragement in our spirits and in our hearts. So, Lord, I pray that everybody that was under the sound of my voice, who was watching with us online, that you would bless them and encourage their hearts even the more. For this, O oh God, we give you our thanks and our praise. And it's this prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me, and we'll see you next time right here at Spirit of New Ministries.